If you're anything like me, when you watch a movie, you get bothered by the little things. No, I'm not talking about plot holes. I'm talking about all those times I've wondered, wait, when do these people sleep? When do they have time to use the bathroom? And most notably, when watching things set in a historical time period, if deodorant wasn't invented yet, how did everyone not smell really, really bad? As someone who's lucky enough to live in a time and place where indoor plumbing, frequent washing, and smelling nice is the norm, the question of personal hygiene in history is one that has always fascinated me. Today I hope to put some of those questions to rest. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Historodame, and today we're discussing what hygiene was like during the Victorian era. <laughs> A great benchmark for determining the level of hygiene in any time period is how often did people wash. In the Victorian era, attitudes towards personal hygiene began to drastically change, with a person's cleanliness largely being seen as an aspect of their social status and morality. During her reign, Queen Victoria helped encourage her subjects to engage in healthy habits, such as washing their hands, hair, and cleaning their teeth. Bathing was a way for those with means to differentiate themselves from the poor, who at the time did not have things like proper soap, indoor bathrooms, or running water. That being said, though semi-regular bathing became commonplace during the 1800s, the Victorians still did not wash as frequently as we do today. Any visible body part that was exposed to the harsh environment of cities, such as the hands, face, and arms, would be washed quite often. But as for the rest of the body, it did not receive the same treatment. Washing for most people consisted of what they had available to them. In the average household, a bathroom could be expected to have a pitcher and wash basin for day-to-day -day cleaning. But when it came to a full-body scrub down, many did not have a proper bathtub. Instead, most bathing was done with smaller amounts of water, kept in a bowl or wash basin, and people would scrub their bodies with a sponge. For middle-class families with slightly more means, a hip tub might have been used, which is kind of like a cross between a chair and a bathtub, where one would sit submerged only up to their hips. Bathing for many meant covering the essentials that weren't as easily reached when wearing clothing, such as the crotch and armpits. Those who had access to a great amount of wealth would experience luxuries such as a clawfoot bathtub, and even taps that ran both hot and cold water. Though throughout most of the Victorian era, this was not the case. Most often, bathtubs would still be filled by servants with buckets of hot water that they ran back and forth from the kitchen. One such luxury that the wealthy might have was a gas-powered tub, which involved a small compartment with a gas flame beneath it that would heat the bathwater for them. Now, if you're hearing this and alarm bells are going off in your head, you're right, this was a problem. There were numerous reports in newspapers of people getting severely burned from boiling themselves like a lobster in the bath. Not to mention the danger that comes from inhaling fumes from the gas burner. But for those who did not have enough money to afford the luxury of a self-boiling tub, or even a hip bath, bathing was not as easy. Poor families would have to do all the work themselves of heating and gathering water, so it didn't make sense to repeat the process for every member of the family. It was not uncommon for working-class families to share bath water, with the order of bathing traveling down the family's hierarchy, starting with the father and ending with the youngest child. Those who lived in larger towns or cities would also have the option of going to a public bath, where they could wash themselves and even do laundry in the same water. Now that's a two-in-one deal. Now if you're only washing semi-regularly, and even then you're not giving attention to all parts of your body, one can assume that smelling bad would become a real issue. After all, it's not as though the Victorians had access to half a dozen old spice scents, so they could smell like the concept of swagger or the mythical kraken. When looking at a picture where a bunch of people walk around a busy street in the 1800s, it's easy to imagine a noxious cloud of B.O. rising above the crowd. But this was not necessarily the case. Since cleanliness was so strongly associated with one's class and respectability, 
smelling a little stale would get you pegged as a member of the lower classes, which of course was an affluent Victorian's nightmare. Because of this, people during the 19th century actually had a number of tricks up their sleeve to mask the old armpit stink. The obvious choice for covering up bad smells, of course, was perfume. Those with the means to do so could purchase perfume in various natural scents, with florals being particularly popular for women, and scents like bay rum for men. A cheaper alternative to perfume was scented powder, which could also be purchased or made at home. This powder would be applied directly to sweaty areas, such as the armpits, to absorb moisture and bacteria, thus reducing any bad smells. If deodorizing powder could not be acquired, baking soda could also do the job. The fact that Victorian fashions contained many layers of undergarments was another way that people could help hide the smell of body odor. Items such as a chemise or undershirt acted as a protective layer between the skin and the rest of the clothing, keeping it free from sweat and body oils. Women also wore dress shields under their arms to give an extra layer of protection and avoid staining any fabric. Because your outer garments rarely made direct contact with the skin, most clothes in the Victorian era weren't washed often at all, or in some cases ever. They would instead be brushed free of dirt regularly to maintain appearance, while the undergarments would be sent to wash. Wealthier individuals would also own more clothes on average, so they could go much longer without needing to do laundry than a member of the working class. Not that they were actually the ones doing the cleaning, though. Now, in the Victorian era, the thing that was the biggest detriment to public health was not the lack of regular bathing or the smell of body odor, but rather the issues that arose with going to the bathroom. For most people, an indoor toilet was a luxury that they would never experience. All they had to look forward to was a hole in the ground. That meant people in the country were going to the outhouse, and those in urban areas would be sharing a public privy with their neighbors. If one wanted to actually use the bathroom in their home, however, they would need to rely on a chamber pot, which was a ceramic dish with a cover, in which you would do your business. There were various setups for using a chamber pot, such as squatting above the dish, using a commode or closet chair, or you could just hold the pot by its handle and position it where it was needed. Now, I know what you're thinking. With all those layers and crazy big hoop skirts, how did Victorian women use the bathroom? Despite how daunting the task may seem from an outside perspective, it actually wasn't so bad. Undergarments that provided the signature Victorian silhouette, such as the crinoline or bustle, were made from flexible and lightweight materials. They could be easily pressed together or partially collapsed so that they didn't get in the way. A woman's underwear was also made with a split crotch, so one only needed to lift the skirt and then they could get to business. Surprise, surprise, Though it looks strange to us, everyday fashions, however wild, were designed to be functional. Later in the Victorian era, when the first indoor toilets began to come on the scene, the chamber pot was quickly on its way out. Indoor plumbing was still not available for even the richest of families until around the 1880s, so the first real toilets in the home were essentially just an indoor version of an outhouse that emptied into a large cesspool in the basement. This pit may have seemed like a nice alternative to the chamber pot at the time, but it still would have to be emptied periodically, and bringing an outhouse into your home meant that the smell would also come with it. Far more concerning than bad smells, however, was the effect that disposing of waste had on cities with large populations like London. You see, for much of the century, the sewage systems in many cities were lacking to say the least. Drains were commonly made of stone, which meant that they allowed sewage and water to leak through the weak spots. Sometimes contaminated water even leaked into people's houses. There were also little to no regulations in place when it came to the dumping of waste, so citizens and companies were free to pollute nearby bodies of water with the contents of their chamber pots or the debris from manufacturing. In the case of London, during the summer of 1858, the River Thames began to stink so badly that the entire city had to shut down. Known as the Great Stink, the smell was so bad that it even interfered with the sitting of Parliament, and would eventually cause London to rework their entire sewage system. 
Luckily, as the 19th century came to an end, and people began to understand more about germs and disease, better hygiene habits were adopted by both individual citizens and cities as a whole. Finally, there was a better quality of life for everyone, and much less smelly places to live. Hey everyone, thank you for watching! If you enjoyed the video, please consider leaving a like or a comment down below. If you want to see more content like this, you can also subscribe to my channel, and keep up to date on all the fun history videos of the future. But for now, I bid you farewell.